How's that looking? Can you see that? Okay. All right. So um, today I'm going to be talking about um, the euphonium, and this uh, this talk will be um, different than the than the talk I gave last week on trombone. Um, in some ways, um, some important one one major important difference between the trombone and the and the euphonium um, that I that I'd like to make sure that people think about is is the challenges that come up with um, with playing the euphonium in terms of um, uh, how you need to encourage people who play this instrument to look forward in their lives to creating opportunities for themselves. Um, uh, I played trombone most of my life, um, and I played euphonium almost as long as I played trombone. Played euphonium in the UT wind ensemble, um, and uh, it's a beautiful instrument. And um, uh, I would say that one one of the things that that, that I want to convey to all of you is that. Um, I'm talking about a particular instrument, but, but really um, what I'm talking about is a deep dive in terms of like how you, uh, how you in help your students engage with their instruments, the repertoire, um, and uh, how you can encourage your uh, applied teachers who teach for you to uh, help you collect information. When I was a kid, my band directors, all, all the information came from my band directors. There are only a, a few of them, and where I lived, we didn't have applied teachers who came to our schools. Um, to spend time with us. And so um, my, my band directors had walls of records and high fidelity record players and um, collected this, this music and information about, um, uh, about the, the, uh, the solo literature. We had a library full of solo literature at my, at my high school. Um, so I would hope that, that those of you who play flute, for example, would, would get something out of this, this talk because um, there are certain things that happen when euphonium players come to, uh, to work with me. And, uh, and I hope that I could, maybe I can help you uh, identify some of the problems and some of the uh, ways that you can be encouraging in terms of uh, helping them find opportunities. So one of the biggest issues that, uh, that band directors and young players come to me with when they, when they show up to study euphonium or when they, they bring their students to me is that it's hard to buy, to purchase a euphonium. Um, they're expensive. And um, uh, as opposed to some other instruments, even finding used ones that are, that are good uh, is, is difficult. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, um, maybe give you some impressions about instruments and um, how to find them and what's important there. Um, the use of the B-flat treble clef, it, it, um, it keeps coming up and people come to me and, and they, they show up on their first week of school and they say, I play B-flat treble clef euphonium. Um, and it's, it's difficult. Um, these parts that are included in your, in your, in your band music libraries, uh, sometimes it's, it's um, easy to put a, somebody who's played trumpet for a while on a B-flat euphonium. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, this will, will be a person who is not a very strong trumpet player, and this is, this is not a good thing, you know, to, uh, to do to a person. Um, it's, it's difficult. I have to break their brains when they come to me and unlearn all that B-flat treble clef, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. These are the challenges. I'm going to go through what I think are viable solutions or, or um, uh, just opportunities that I've seen that euphonium players find for themselves in a little bit. Um, uh, performing gigs. Okay, so um, you don't find euphoniums typically in a jazz ensemble, uh, in a professional jazz ensemble, but uh, hopefully in any, uh, when we have band camp jazz ensembles, we don't exclude anybody who wants to play any instrument. We find a place for them. Um, and the same is true at school. If, if uh, a monster uh, euphonium player wants to play some jazz and they don't want to play trombone, I'll let them play. We'll, we'll get them in there. And that, there are places that you can make this available for your students. It's harder when it comes to classical gigs. Um, it's harder, you know, euphonium players can play in brass quintets. Um, there are play issues where there are gonna be trombone parts that involve glissandos and things like that that make it difficult. Um, but they don't typically play in orchestras, not typically. And I'm gonna talk about that. There are opportunities and there are places where um, a, a strong player should know how to do that and where that would be good for them. Um, and this next, this next thing, there, there are different universes of repertoires for this instrument. Universes of repertoire. Um, it's very complicated. The instrument is uh, less old than, you know, some instruments that have amazing repertoires that go back centuries. 
And so we find euphonium players uh, taking repertoire from, you can see the next point, stealing, uh, using transcriptions, um, or, uh, well, and I'll go, and I'll get into the repertoire universes in a minute. Um, but the modern repertoire, and I'm going to cover that too, uh, the most modern repertoire, some of it's just way too difficult for uh, band directors to, uh, to, to encourage students to play. But it doesn't mean from this very moment, and this is something that I've been thinking about all day, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't introduce them to this and that, and that in my opinion, that you shouldn't be aware of it. Um, if you play um, percussion, then you undoubtedly know who Gordon Stout is or Lee Howard Stevens, you know, somebody like that. Um, and I would imagine that if you are a percussion, uh, were a percussion major as a music ed major, um, that you would encourage your students to listen to those recordings, that you might have them. And whether you had them or not, you'd know to look those people up on YouTube um, and to help your students sit down and, and do some of that listening. And so I would encourage you, regardless of your instrument, to try to do this kind of deep listening for every instrument. And I probably should have led off with that because it's been on my mind lately. Um, typically, um, we, when, when I come visit your band room, I'm going to find your students wherever they are and I'm gonna to try to help them. Um, but when it comes to your low brass students, your trombone students, and your euphonium students, if I can get them alone teaching them private lessons or in master classes several times, like in a band camp situation, for example, you can bet that I'm going to introduce them to some of the great recordings, and, um, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Okay, when it comes to instruments, um, I, I said this a minute ago, euphoniums are expensive. Um, when we teach, when I teach my methods class, um, I have what I would consider to be a, a fairly representative um, uh, menagerie of the kinds of euphoniums that you might have available to you in your band rooms. We don't have a, a huge budget for me to have um, a whole bunch of Yamaha 842s uh, that are brand new for my methods class. So any of you who were in that class, I recognize that I've got several former students here, here today. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Um, sometimes we, we have the three valve tiny little horn that, that just really doesn't play in tune at all. Uh, sometimes we have the four valve horn um, that you would think would be great, but it's non compensating four valves on the top um, and or may have one or two tuning slides that are crammed all the way in that just can't be taken out without a deep cleaning because we can't frequently afford, for example. Um, so one thing that I would want you to understand is that when they, when they come to me, music majors who play euphonium, sometimes they show up with a horn that they've bought. And often that's not a great thing because what they've done is they found a horn that they could afford for a certain amount of money and it's got problems or it's just not really well made or, um, I mean, it could have um, debilitating intonation issues. Um, that just won't go away. Um, and then later they'll want, if they're very serious and they get good at what they're doing, they're gonna want a good horn and, and they may not have seven or $8,000 because they spent three back when they first went to college. So um, I would say that the thing, hold on a second. Mr. Futurer, can you mute yourself just for now? I think you took yourself off of mute and I'm hearing a lot of ambient sounds. I don't know if I can mute you or not. I don't think so. Thank you, okay. Um, intonation, accuracy, response, particularly for me, and I know this is, this is maybe more information than you, than you need right now, but believe me, if you play this instrument, you know what I'm talking about. A high G and a high B natural above the bass clef staff, these are deal-breaking notes for horns that sometimes sound great, like in every way, but for whatever reason won't slot on these notes. You don't have to know the exact notes, but what I, what I would say is that you, what you want to do is if you buy any horns, you want to bring them to somebody who knows and have them play, play them and, and check them out before you, um, you know, have had them for too long and you, and you can't send them back. Um, if you're looking for a top drawer, really fine instrument, I play a Yamaha 842 series. Um, you're probably not going to be able to afford to buy a bunch of those for your, your band room. What I see a lot of are Yamaha four valve on top non-compensating horns that lasts for a long time. I mean, they, they're, they're really well made. Um, it may not be ideal, um, but a, a strong player can learn to use four valves on top and they can get the non-compensating system to work fairly well for them if they have to. I recommend that you try to buy a compensating horn. And for those of you who may have forgotten the compensating versus non-compensating issue is an issue of, of uh, intonation 
uh, fingerings in the lower register in particular, and, um, and notes that may, you know, like the low B natural that wouldn't be available at all on a non-compensating horn. Then again, you don't have to play below the bass clef staff down to a low B natural very often on the euphonium. But these are, these are notes that when, you're, you know, when, when your students want to buy a good horn, if they've got uh, the money to do it, then send them to, to somebody who knows. Send them to me and I'll, I'll talk to them about it. But if you can get a fourth valve on the side, definitely. Three valve, stay away. If you can avoid three valve, stay away. Um, okay, because they're expensive, and if you buy these instruments and you have them in your band room, your students are going to be using instruments that basically you have to account for. Um, I would just recommend checking in with those people often. I mean, I'm sure you do this, and, and this is maybe something that um, is just not really worth getting into for, for very long, but uh, wipe them down. Use uh, the, when people take instruments to conventions and people play them all day long, you've got kids playing these trumpets all day long. They wipe them down with isopropyl alcohol that you can buy at Walmart and they, and they use a washcloth and you just, um, it eats up all that uh, stuff from your skin um, and it's, it's good. Um, proper valve oil, I see oftentimes that somebody will have, for instance, like my, my Yamaha that I use um, has close tolerance valves, so they're very flush against the casing. So I use um, the Hetman's the light piston oil on that. Often I see people using uh, oil that doesn't work very well. What I see that's really worse than that is people using oil that just comes with whatever horn or you know that they uh, that the students bought or rented or whatever. Um, a lot of that oil is terrible. It's the same thing with um, with trombone slide oil. Um, awful. Just throw it out and get something good. I recommend Hetman's, but there are other products that are uh, very comparable to that. Um, and so you know, I just um, want you to take care of your horns. B flat treble clef, um, again, I think it's very problematic. I said this earlier. Um, take them off of this. If, they're, if, they, if they moved over from another instrument, hopefully they didn't start on B flat treble clef. Don't even get me started about that. But if they, if they move down from trumpet, for example, um, and they're having trouble with bass clef, take all their B flat treble clef away from them. Don't let them write note names in. Note names in. And, um, and if, if you can, just send them to Walmart, get some flashcards, and have the staff on one side with the note and then on the other side just the note name and then get them to do it as quickly as they can. That's what I do to them. That's what was recommended um, for me as a teacher a long time ago and um, it works okay but they, if, I can't stress this enough. It's the same thing with clefs. Uh, last week I mentioned the, the different clefs, tenor clef, alto clef. Um, don't just stay away from, from having them write notes in. Um, ironically if they do read B flat treble clef um, then it'll be easy for them to read trumpet music which is good. In terms of transposition. Okay. Um, okay, here, this is the thing I said earlier about finding work. Okay, so your euphonium players, if you have advanced euphonium players um, who are going to go to college and this is going to be their instrument, they have to ask some questions very early on in terms of performance that other musicians may not have to ask. Um, in terms of opportunities, um, military bands, uh, you know, you've got military bands all over the country. You've got the, the bands that play for the president, the elite bands. This is one of the major homes for professional euphonium players. This is where they go. Um, there are, um, and many people are not interested in doing that. And so you need to talk to them very early on. They, may, maybe they don't want to go to boot camp or they have some reason why they, why they can't do it. Um, orchestral specializations, I'm going to talk about this in a, in a minute. Um, there are valve specializations, uh, there are gigs for people who, who play these valve low brass instruments in orchestras, for example. So um, oftentimes a trombone player will learn how to do it and you've got to compete with them and you've got to get in there if you play euphonium. And um, that leads me to another, another subject that's related and that's doubling. It's a very good idea for anyone who plays euphonium to either double on trombone or tuba. Um, there are a lot of gigs uh, for those instruments uh, that, that you can't, that you don't usually find on euphonium, whether it's jazz or classical, um, and they're, they double on euphonium. So um, mastering the slide can be difficult early on for euphonium player. Then again, trombone players pick up the euphonium and they think they can play it really well in the first five minutes. And they end up like I did when I was in the UT wind ensemble and I tried to play a high G with the second valve. Um, you know, it's, it's a, there's not a direct correlation, not an exact perfect direct correlation between trombone slide uh, positions and euphoniums uh, fingerings. So 
Um, uh, but it's it's a good idea for them to, to to start to try to master the slide early on if they can because the mouth the mouthpiece is more similar to the trombone the range is more similar obviously than it is for the tuba so kind of depends on what they're good at um, creating gigs this is something that musicians do th today anyway you have to I mean there's um, and it, and it's never been more important than it is right now for all of us to be looking towards the future and making sure that we are enterprising and we know how to um, how to create work for ourselves. Um, you tuba players, euphonium players, classical saxophone players are good at this um, because you have to be. And um, uh, starting a, a chamber ensemble is good. There's a whole lot of tuba euphonium uh, quartet repertoire. So when you're looking at solo and ensemble, um, I would in, uh, encourage you to encourage your students to start a group like that if you can. Obviously teaching is, a, is something that a lot of your students are gonna do. They're gonna come and be music ed majors and I understand that. Um, sometimes uh, they'll want to be an applied collegiate teacher that would involve usually these days getting a master's degree and, and having a doctorate and having extensive performance performance experience. Um, and then again, I didn't mention this when I talked about trombone, but this is something that all of applied people uh, have to consider because it's happening. It's been going on for a long time. Uh, you know, if you meet, if you move to Dallas or Houston, you can teach 90 students a week if you can handle that. Um, and if you can handle starting your day at 4.30 or whatever um, and going until 9 or 10 o'clock at night in a middle school band room and having to drive halfway across Houston and stay up late and get up late, um, it's, a, it's, it's a, something that, that people do. A hybrid lifestyle would think where you have a day job is better. But um, competitions, I mentioned the Leonard Falcone competition. Until they're 20 years old, a lot of your students might, if, if, they're, if they're strong, uh, you might uh, consider entering them in something like this. Uh, euphonium players should get a head start on uh, everything that, that they can do if they if they want to be performers and I didn't start with that everybody doesn't want to be a professional performer um, and this isn't this isn't just geared towards those people but um, these are considerations okay so I, I talked about the universe of repertoires okay so in the euphonium world you've got brass band music um, obviously concert band music that your students will be familiar with um, Hopefully, if, they, if, they're, if you have a, a strong program, they, they know Festive Overture and they know the Melody Shop March and um, have the fingers to, to, to navigate through um, and numerous uh, circus marches, the circus beat, whatever, um, and, and, and know, um, you know, Irish tune and know that solo is coming. And um, uh, so this is, this is a repertoire that I would imagine that they understand somewhat. Um, euphonium repertoire borrows heavily from the cornet repertoire of the late 19th and early 20th century. So if you're using the Arben book with your students, um, then all the solos in the back of the Arben book, any of the Herbert L. Clark solos, um, I call them the ducka 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 solos because they're, they're, they're full of, um, you know, fast technical um, uh, passages. And this is a, an important part of the repertoire. Euphonium players should know Bride of the Waves. They should have tried to play Carnival of Venice. Um, the, you know, th there's a lot of music here that's beautiful, but a lot of it is kind of flashy. And it, I think it's, uh, it's cool. You've got to work on their technique. They need to, uh, to have this under their fingers and understand it. Um, but there's no, I mean, the, the cornerstone of the, of the newer repertoire um, I think is, is where I have them playing most of the time in my studio. They obviously steal quite a bit from trombone, uh, cello, and bassoon repertoire. Um, I would recommend that you get on IMSLP and look into that uh, later. Um, the French conservatory repertoire, uh, most instruments in, in co like college applied teachers rely fairly heavily on this uh, repertoire. So for, for a long time um, in Par uh, Paris Conservatory and in conservatories in France in general, there were these pieces that were written that were um, uh, specifically for uh, for study in a sort of a, an attempt to to um, graduate or have progressively um, challenging pieces for students. Um, the uh, the trombone repertoire that you phone that uh, people who play euphonium steal from is really beautiful in this in, um, in this period. Um, I talked about orchestral repertoire or, or, or orchestral opportunities for people who play euphonium. Um, there are all these instruments that many of us have kind of heard of and maybe know or have heard about, but don't really, uh, don't really know. 
there, there's a, a now defunct magazine. I don't think it exists anymore. It's called the Historic Brass Band Journal. Um, and and what, you, what you'll find is that for centuries, there've been these instruments, like all kinds of amazing instruments. And they just, because they haven't made it into the standard orchestral or band configuration, we don't know about them. But the, uh, the tenor tuba or tenor horn, um, uh, the, these are kind of conf confusing designations, but um, you know, uh, the bass trumpet, which is a, a big trumpet that people who play euphonium will often know how to play. Trombone players learn how to play these instruments. Um, you know, if, if you have an advanced student who's gonna go to college and study this instrument and they go all the way and they become like, you know, a, a, a strong applied faculty member, they're going to be the people who the Arkansas Symphony is going to call. They call, um, they call Jamie Lipton from um, Henderson to come up. She studied with Brian Bowman. She's an amazing euphonium player. So when there's a bass trumpet part or um, a tenor tuba part in, in the Ein Helden Leben, um, they haven't played Mahler 7. Um, it sure would be cool if they did. When they played the Rite of Spring, I played with them and she came and played the bass trumpet part. Um, I played that when I was at Rice. Um, these are specializations and it, it's, it's kind of like this. I, I know that all this seems like a little bit of a deep dive maybe, but um, your euphonium players are going to have to know everything they can about every single opportunity. I mean, we all do these days. Um, and these are things that I would hope that you would at least consider sitting around and listening to with them or, or pointing them to these recordings um, or, you know, telling them about these opportunities. Uh, vocal music, you'll frequently find euphonium players playing like Nesson Dorma on a, on a degree recital, something like that. Um, uh, but in the, in the more, more recent years, um, there has been developed a, a complete repertoire for the instrument. In the 70s, um, uh, these pieces by Donald White and uh, Clinard, that's a beautiful unaccompanied piece. These are the kinds of pieces that they play on degree recitals today. So um, if you need help, helping them choose something to play for solo and ensemble contest, please come to me. Please let me know if I can be helpful. I've got lists of this stuff and I'll get into it. Um, I mentioned jazz here because um, I've known a lot of great jazz musicians who played euphonium and I don't think it's something that you wanna discount if somebody's interested in it. Again, make opportunities for them and point them to these, uh, these great recordings of these amazing musicians. So, um, this is just, this is the beginning of, of uh, Mahler's Symphony Number no. 7. So the, for those of you who aren't familiar with Mahler, Gustav Mahler is arguably the greatest symphonic composer of all time. And this is the tenor horn solo just right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then here's a look, just a little bit later. Now, are your, is your best Allstate euphonium player going to end up playing with Mahler 7 with Claudio Abbado conducting him? Maybe not. Um, maybe not. But is this worth knowing about? Absolutely. Is that one of the coolest moments for that instrument? I mean, the tenor horn, um, the, the tenor tuba, uh, these instruments project a little bit better than euphonium, but it's the same, it's the same concept and, and the same people play these instruments. And um, I just think it's, it's worth doing this. When my band director was, a, my assistant band director was a trombone player and he would give me Bill Watcher's records and say, this is possible, you should do this. Um, and uh, I didn't know any better. I, I just tried to do that all the time. And um, it's, you know, probably, I'm, I'll never be Bill Watrous, but man, I probably wouldn't be me if I hadn't tried all that stuff. Um, and so this is, you know, I guess maybe the, in keeping with like my, my bigger message today, which is just um, find people who love this stuff, you know, like me and, and, and bring us around and keep us around when you can and, and um, and help us find, find, help your students find their passion. This is Rich Madison, check this out. Rich Madison, um, maybe the most famous uh, jazz euphony player, or euphony player who plays jazz. Um, check out just a little bit of this. <laughs> Thank you. 
I knew that high note was coming. I just wanted to let it go until he, until he played that note. Um, you know, it, I think it's worth give, taking the time and um, helping these guys get inspired in any way they can about playing music. And um, again, I, I just wouldn't limit them if they're into jazz, especially. Um, okay, so the repertoire I mentioned uh, from the 70s onward, there's a lot of great solos and I'll, I'll, I'll include some of them on my, on my uh, list um, of suggested begin of solos to just introduce people to solo and ensemble. But uh, in keeping with the theme of just like how high should we, should we shoot and why would we not go ahead and listen to some of the, the biggest, uh, most epic pieces. Th these are some pieces from the modern, the most modern euphonium uh, composers. Philip Spark, James Kernow, John Stevens, he's a tuba player, John Boda, Vladimir Kosma, the Kosma Concerto is, is amazing. Um, Hovannis wrote a, a concerto, um, and Jan Bach, who if you, if you know the piece, um, Oh, what's that? Um, I think of Laudis, the, the, uh, the brass quintet, but there's a famous band piece by Jan Bach. I remember when I was a kid um, playing some, um, some, some Jan Bach, but maybe I'm getting that wrong. No, I might be getting that wrong. Anyway, um, Philip Spark, on the other hand, uh, this, this is like one of the, the composers who I would recommend that you, you get your, your, uh, your students to listen to. I'm going to play just a little bit of a Philip Spark piece in a, in a minute for you. Uh, this part, this, I've, I'm included this, these resources last week, uh, most of them, with the exception of euphonium.com when I was talking about trombone. Uh, check out euphonium.com. Adam Fry, this is his site. Um, there's a store on there. There's a lot of good repertoire. Um, and Adam Fry is a good resource. He's a friend of mine. He's very accessible. He's an amazing euphonium player. Um, I would check out his site. The, the, the Gordon Cherry Orchestral Excerpt Collection that I mentioned last week, um, it's got the bass trumpet and tenor tuba stuff on it. So if, you're, if your students get excited about Ein Heldenleben or uh, the Rite of Spring or whatever, it's here. Um, Wikipedia, often we mention just that there's a Wikipedia article uh, about something. This one's a very good one. I would highly recommend you just sit down and read this. Euphon People who play euphonium are very passionate. They don't do anything halfway. And this article is amazing. Um, it's got historical context, context, lists of repertoire by genre that I mentioned today. Um, it's more or less congruent with what I said. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's just a good resource to, uh, to send your students, just have them read about their instrument and learn about it. Here's uh, some introductory repertoire that like this Barat Andante and Allegro, for example, is very famous. Any trombone player knows this piece. Euphonium, play, uh, people who play euphonium know this piece. This is that Paris Conservatory uh, uh, rep I was talking about. There's a lot of Baroque pieces, uh, Galliard, Corelli, Marcello. You'll find those on I I IMSLP. I'm going to mention that later. Um, Prior Thoughts of Love, it's a trombone piece, but it's in keeping with that cornet literature, the turn of the century band uh, solo literature, the Bach unaccompanied pieces for cello, any, any cello piece that, that, that you can play. If you can make it work on euphonium, I highly recommend it if it's not impossible. Um, I'm going to talk about the Spark Pantomime in a minute, but these are some of the harder pieces, so the Cosma Concerto. Um, okay, so the, I just included this. It's just, it's by no means uh, uh, a complete repertoire for euphonium, but it's just a beginning. So this is Stephen Mead. He's one of my favorite euphonium players. He came to my, my university and changed my life when I was at the University of Texas because I didn't even think that half of what he could do was possible on any instrument. So here, here's Stephen Mead playing the beginning of the Spark Pantomime, it's a really famous piece for Euphonium and Band. It's pretty, right? I remember he came to the University of Texas and he said, it's got shades of... Christmas present for all and then he said he would... And gentlemen, the look. He said it's got shades of a, fee, a piece that you might find that's familiar. And I knew what it was right away, but for anybody who's an Ann Murray fan... Bright a tear, you wiped it dry. I was confused. So obviously this composer was, uh, I don't know, kind of, kind of uh, like that, I would think, like that song. So um, this repertoire is not completely unreachable by an advanced collegiate player if they know about it because you introduce them to it maybe they'll play it when they come to when they come to school eventually Okay, 
So, um, and this is uh, a little bit later in the piece, there, there, come, there is a point where it gets like kind of ridiculously hard. <laughs> So obviously it takes a, um, you know, a lot of work, a lot of time and energy and hard work to play that piece. But if you, if you Google that piece, you can see there's a, um, a young lady who plays it. I, man, I could, she could be 22 or 23, maybe. She may be younger um, and, and plays the heck out of it. So um, Philip Spark, and this is a composer who I'd recommend that you want to introduce your students to. Um, okay, so those are some of the unique challenges um, and uh, as I see them and um, introducing euphonium players to heroes is a, is a big thing. I could have just done a whole class on heroes. I just picked a few who are some of mine. Obviously, Brian Bowman, you know, um, Michael Colburn. I mean, they're um, childs. I mean, they're, they're these amazing uh, soloists who are uh, who you, you, you want your, uh, your students to listen to. In terms of methods, um, euphonium players in, in Arkansas share the, uh, the requirement that they play out of the Rochu book. Um, the Rochu melodious etudes I mentioned in my Tremont class, there are 120 of them progressively arranged from the vocal essays of Marco Bergoni. Um, it's, this is Italian opera music. This is where you want to uh, have your people start listening. And I mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. They should listen to Italian opera whenever possible. If you can turn them on to this stuff, um, um, it will help them. The technical studies are a little bit different. Um, I, you know, they have to play, I think that they have to play Tyrells in Arkansas for competition, but um, I would, I have my students all playing the Herbert L. Clark technical studies for bass clef instruments. This is super important. Um, trumpet players use these. You hear people playing ba ba da 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 so practical, um, but if you can play it fast enough and accurately, they, they will work. Nevertheless, um, the Herbert L. Clark technical studies and all the different keys um, are super important for the fingers. And I would recommend that you buy this book. I mean, have it in your band room, um, seriously. Get the bass clef version. Um, on IMSLP, you can find the old cornet version in, in uh, B flat treble clef, ironically, but uh, the Arben book, uh, mention this with, with trombone, it's super important for trumpet and euphonium. Uh, Arben Complete Method, get a bass clef version of the book. And um, again, you don't necessarily have to buy the most expensive one that was just compiled recently by famous people. Although those books are full of cool stuff, you can just buy maybe a less expensive one that's just got the notes in it. Um, the Weizenborn Bassoon Method is excellent for advanced students. Um, if you can um, get, get them to look into the Weizenborn Method, they've got to be good at it. But um, uh, over here on the right, What's good for trombone sometimes is good for euphonium. Long tones, lip flexibility exercises, um, scales, the Remington method. I use this with my students. Um, it's, I teach very differently when I teach euphonium, but, um, but not when it comes to long tones and stuff like that, except that I'm, we're working on slightly different things because there'll be fingerings that'll have different tuning tendencies on the euphonium than they will on trombone. So you have to learn all that. Um, these resources are the same resources I included last week, the TMEA prescribed music list, IMSLP, WorldCat. Um, so look for euphonium solos in the per, uh, under code in the prescribed music list. And you can um, just keep downloaded um, a comprehensive list and sit in, on YouTube with your student all day long or send them away and have them do it and have them cross-reference it um, with that list. And, uh, and it's, I highly recommend that. Um, let's see. Yeah, I talked about this earlier. Okay, so when you, okay, here's a problem with IMSLP and euphonium. Um, the, 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 the universe of repertoires, for example, if you just Google euphonium and IMSLP, something like this comes up. So if you look at this, you see Stephen Beatty, like all these, every other piece is Stephen Beatty. Um, if you look up these pieces, um, you can find them, they're on an IMSLP, but they look like really complicated modern music. Um, what they what it looks like they are is music that's really not that complicated that somebody has used some sort of computer software to uh, transcribe into a MIDI file that didn't work. 
And so unfortunately, you're looking through some stuff that's really good and you're looking through these pieces that may be very good by Stephen Beatty, but the way they come out up on IMSLP is confusing. When your student comes, goes, goes into a place like this, they're even more bored than you are listening to me right now. And so uh, when they, they'll, they'll stop looking at it. They'll just, they'll just give up on it. Um, and you can't, you, um, you can't let that happen. You've got to um, find somebody to teach them private lessons, get somebody to come in or do a deep dive in this with this yourself. If you um, go into IMSLP and you look under cello, for example, you can find a million pieces. There's so many great Baroque pieces for cello. Um, there are, you've got, but you've got to look hard. Like um, you'll find figured bass that's not realized and all kinds of stuff. But if you keep looking, you may, you'll probably find a, a version of the Vivaldi cello sonatas for cello and piano. I mean, I did, so eventually you will. The Bach cello suites, download these right away. The Bach un six suites for unaccompanied cello. So many people who play different instruments play these pieces. They're practical on euphonium. They actually work on euphonium. They're, it's, they're harder to play on trombone. Um, uh, not every movement is easy and there are multiphonics if you want to do double stops and stuff that I wouldn't do I would just break up the, the the chord and there are arrangements of these pieces but if they're looking for free repertoire the Baroque repertoire is some of the some of the easy stuff to find Bach, Marcello, Galliard sonatas. Bois Martier um, was a composer who wrote a lot of uh, fine duets. Um, if you want to get your euphonium players, trombone players, trombone, euphonium, tuba um, to, to play with each other Get these Bois Martier duets. They're amazing. They're beautiful. And there, there are lots of them. And they're free. Um, I mentioned opera songs earlier. This is a kind of an interesting phenomenon that's been happening for a while. The, I, I think of it as sort of the, a song for Japan phenomenon. Um, this composer wrote this piece when they, there was this earth, the tsunami, uh, earth, earthquake in Japan. And um, uh, it was, uh, you know, it's, if, if you Google a song for Japan, you can find a recording of like all the world's greatest trombone players playing it in groups of one and two and three and four. If you find a song for Japan online, you can find every version of it from the single instrument version to soloist with band, soloist with orchestra, um, the octet version, um, and it's for free. You can download it. And so, you know, when uh, my previous job, I played it with the band at, at school. It was easy. You downloaded it, you printed it out, we, and we mixed it up a little bit. We did the solo version, and at some point near the end, we cut the band off, and we did the four trombone version, and my, my, th my three of my students walked out from behind the band and finished it with me, um, and, it's, and it's free. So this kind of uh, thing, if you can find the good stuff uh, inside of all of the, the free stuff that, you know, some of it's not very good, then it's cool. Like I mentioned, the Clark's uh, Cornet Studies, B-flat treble clef, and the Arben book, or at least one version of the many versions of the Arben book, are for free on IMSLP. So if somebody can read B-flat treble clef or they can transpose, uh, you can find it. But I recommend that you, that you buy the, the Arben book and own it, uh, have it in your band room. This is stuff that I talked about with uh, the trombone class, but I think it's important uh, in terms of details. Um, something that, that um, Beth and, and Dan talked about in the last hour, having a plan, whether you realize your plan or not. Um, when, when it comes to breathing, for example, planning all your breaths in a piece of music. Um, when, I, when I have a student who just thinks that, that he or she can just wing it and make it through a piece of music, um, a lot of times it'll work and then it won't work. You know, there, there'll be that one time when it doesn't work. And then I stop and ask, well, wouldn't a plan have been better wouldn't just seeing your little plan for your breathing ahead a little bit, whether it's a big breath or a regular breath or a catch breath, wouldn't that inform how you're going to finish the phrase you're in right now? Maybe you see a breath coming and you can really milk it at the end of the phrase you're in. Maybe you see a breath that's not going to come for a long time, so you save it so you don't die. Your peripheral vision will be how, you, how you're dealing with that in real time, and you'll be dealing with it on a secondary level of consciousness. So um, do yourself a favor and put all that information on there. Plan it out in your practicing. Try things and see what you can do. Don't overextend yourself. A few extra breaths would be better than, um, than doing something ambitious that you pulled off once in a practice room that you can't do every day. Um, and I, I said this uh, in last week too in the trombone class, subdivisions, practicing subdivisions in longer notes, uh, micromanaging crescendos and decrescendos. If you have a lot of information that you've that you've sort of crafted into the story that you're trying to tell with your um, with your Allstate music in particular, um, that will distinguish you um, uh, against everybody else who's playing those same pieces. So just write down to having very good time in a slightly longer note that's tied to a note, or a, having your dotted notes be sort of doubly dotted thirty seconds instead of dotted sixteenths, so that there's never an indication that it might have been a triplet. 
Um, those are things that, that distinguish people in those upper chairs um, for Allstate. So um, I mentioned how, to, uh, how my teacher taught me practicing vibrato. Um, this was Donald Knob at the University of Texas. He studied with Remington and he, he lift up his vibrato from pitch. So always above the note, he had me practicing at quarter note equals 60 at five cycles per second. Um, and that was a good way to practice vibrato, always with the chops, always with the lips, and, and, and he discouraged um, vibrato from the belly. A lot of your students will, will generate vibrato without really knowing what they're, what they're doing. Um, and they can get a pretty decent result with the, with the belly. So you think it's okay until you get nervous. So now you, you're nervous and you've got a butterfly, stomach full of butterflies. You're trying to use those same muscles to control vibrato. Um, I think that's one of the great reasons not to use it um, so, and to use it from the, from the chops. Um, so uh, I, I think that's uh, most of what I came prepared to talk about today. Um, uh, if you have any questions, then fire away. Connor, ask a question. Yeah, my unmute was not. <laughs> that's right, Connor on the hot seat. Oh, man. Connor's still trying to get into the game here this summer. He's going to hop a gig here any minute. Excellent. Bunch of band directors out here dealing with euphonium on a daily basis. Um, the world of the euphonium and the baritone, mm -hmm. Dr. Reed, I don't, he didn't quite take that one head on just yet. I, I'll share with everybody. I, I, I asked a prominent publisher once why they – call the parts in baritone, uh, in, in some of the young band repertoire baritone. And uh, he told me it's because the band directors like it. Uh oh, really? Yeah. And so I asked the band directors, why do you call it the baritone? And they said, well, that's what it says in the parts. Right. So we have this vicious circle going on right now. Well, I, I would say that these days, the, the general consensus is that a euphonium is conical mo uh, uh, mostly and, and a baritone is cylindrical mostly which just means that the euphonium, the main pipe of euphonium begins to flare out in a conical fashion earlier than the, the baritone horn does. Uh, I mean, obviously all of your modern brass instruments flare out eventually. Um, you know, you take the cornet, that's conical as opposed to the trumpet, which is cylindrical. So, I mean, I think that's, that's mainly what the modern instruments, how they realize themselves. Um, but over time, uh, everything under the sun has been has been called a baritone and euphonium. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people think that if the bell bends and, and goes forward, that it's a, a baritone horn. But if that horn is is conical, then for my money, it's a it's a euphonium. Um, uh, like I said, there are lots of different instruments out there. I mean, if you want to talk just for a, a second about instruments that that I find laying around that I that I kind of like that work. Um, and I hate to say this, but those Yamaha four valve on top non-compensating euphoniums, I think are the ones that are the most, maybe the most cost effective because I see them in, in band rooms all over the place and they just, they, they last I and mean, they just, they're, they're well made. Um, I like to have somebody have a valve, fourth valve on the side and I like to have a conical instrument, I mean a, a compensating instrument when I can get a hold of one, but I'll settle for something that works where the valves don't, don't dive. You got to take care of them and you have to have them cleaned. I think sometimes and you have to make sure that your students don't, don't treat them badly. Um, Cause it's, if if it's not their horn and they treat it like a used car, it's or, or a rental car um, that you got to watch them. Don't let them, don't let them do it because they're expensive. We got some chat action here. Uh, Sophie asks a trick question, advice for woodwind music majors who want to learn brass instruments especially you found That's a great question. Um, you know, actually I've had people, wait, is that Sophie Vargas who asked that question? That's the one. Oh, well, Sophie knows the answer already. You take a methods class, you get excited about it, and then you sign up for secondary lessons in the fall, which, um, which I think Sophie plans to do. But you know what, that's, that's a great question, Sophie. Um, you know, sometimes you get in these methods classes and it's hard. And sometimes you get in, you know, it, I've found like sometimes with percussionists, it's hard, right? When you start playing trying to play a brass instrument, <laughs> Connor's like, yeah, it's hard. Connor's an excellent tuba player. Well, you know, it, we all, it, it's amazing what we're, how we're built and what our natural tendencies are and our talents and the shape of our face and everything that we can do or can't do. And when you, when you jump in as an adult and you, and all of a sudden, boom, you're in this class, you have to figure it out. Sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's not hard and you, and you find a voice that you enjoy. Um, I've had, you, I had a, a horn player who um, really enjoyed playing euphonium and, and took uh, secondary lessons with me and, and got into it for years. 
um, and I've had woodwind players do it. And um, I highly recommend that you that you pick an instrument that's out of your comfort zone, you know, and and take some secondary if you can. And when you're going through the music ed experience, try to play it in concert band or symphonic band. I always encourage my trombone players to play euphonium and euphonium uh, majors to play trombone. And I, whether it's uh, a, a tuba euphonium quartet or tuba euphonium ensemble or for the trombone players or if it's trombone choir for the people who play euphonium they get in there and they suddenly are dealing with people who are using different fingerings than they're used to uh, for instance you have just a middle c on the euphonium it's a little flat with the first valve on the trombone we play that in sharp third position that note's in sharp third that's it on euphonium that note's flat and needs to be lipped up and you might crack it and so you got to kind of deal with that and that that's at least those are my opinions on those notes and um when my euphonium players are playing in trombone choir and they and they have that note in dead solid third i, I tell them to raise it all the trombone players look at them it's the same thing with the first time a trombone player tries to play a high g with the second valve with euphonium because it's in second position on the trombone super sharp second you can't do that and um that happened to me and the guy who sat next to me just said, no, 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 no. Shut down the rehearsal and we had to go spend like three hours together hanging out. So, um, you know, which wasn't a whole lot of fun for me, but that's All right. I mean. So, um, uh, uh, Professor Futurer is here. Uh, I know what he's going to ask. I can't even see the chat. He thinks Adolf Sachs invented the phoneme, doesn't he? Yeah. Or was it the German Summer or Zomer? How do you say his name? Uh, there were... There, there were two instruments invented in the same year. I think it was 1843. I think uh, you might be right, Somer, something like that. He invented yeah. the, 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 uh, the tenor horn, I think, which would eventually become the euphonium. Uh, and I think Adolf Sax invented the, uh, was it uh, like a, ba a bass sax horn or something that would eventually be more akin to the baritone horn? Um, and so these are these, these are instruments that were invented in the same year. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, what uh, the purists think about um, about, you know, how the lineage should be. Uh, should go where it should go back to but you've got stories of people playing you know these horns and and uh, uh you know having having the the great composers of the day try them out and yeah. uh change them up you know the wagner tubas in there too a little bit i think i held was originally written for wagner tubas and uh, yeah. uh and uh strauss heard it and it was so bad that he said we can't do that and, and people started playing it on tenor horn um which is a b flat instrument um you also get instruments in different keys. You, um, you've got all the bass trumpets that are in different keys. And when you when the Rite of Spring comes around, you get the whatever bass trumpet is in the area. The, the, when I played it at Rice, we, uh, we I found an instrument that was pitched in F. It was terrible. One of the kick valves didn't even work. And I'd have trumpet lessons to figure out how to play it in tune. Um, so there are, there are lots of different instruments, and um, you you pick you pick up the one that you that you've got and you learn to play it. But um, yeah. Well, and I, I'm not sure if Professor Blasdell did it intentionally right after Mr. Fewer's comment, but he asked if the euphoniums are supposed to sound good, where do you put the bad kids? Saxophone? Oh, did he? Oh. He actually, so now Tina and Sophie are after Niles. So Niles, you better look out. You, oh. got the, you got Tina and Sophie coming after you. Well, I'm not going to take that on. Oh, uh, Liam asks a real question for okay. euphoniums, uh, euphoniumists trying their hands at secondary instruments, what do you look to recommend other than tuba trombone? Uh, well, uh, both, but um, it, obviously uh, the early quick, well, in, in one way, the, the, the better translation, I think early on is trombone. You get a good translation either way, but it's kind of like you get different things out of e either translation. You go from euphonium to tuba, you obviously get all the fingerings and intonation uh, tendencies and everything. It's just a, like a big euphonium. But you have a different mouthpiece, different breathing, different speeds of air, a whole lot more air. Uh, there's a lot to consider. It can mess with your euphonium chops a little bit if you play a whole bunch of tuba. Um, it can also, with some people, with me, it helps me. If I play, if I try to play a whole bunch of tuba, it doesn't sound very good. And then I pick up my trombone, my euphonium, and I'm like, oh, I've got air to, to burn. Um, uh, with trombone, you've got a similar mouthpiece. You've got, uh, or the same mouthpiece a lot of times. I, I just use my gray black. I just move it over between my trombone and euphonium. It works great. Um, the Shilke mouthpieces that people use, the 51D, um, those are great mouthpieces. They work fine on trombone too. It's not my favorite on trombone, but it works great on either instrument. Um, but basically the range of the instruments is similar um, and the mouthpiece is similar enough that when you, when you switch from trombone to euphonium, you get that level of translation that's great because um, physically, just in terms of your air and your chops, which is super important, um, you you don't mess things mess with things too much. But when you translate, you go from this to doing this, it's a big deal. It's a really big deal because there's an infinite number of slide positions. They're very subtle. 
and we use different partials that are partial that are possible on the trombone because we can we can manipulate the slide into microtonal areas that you can't with valves, um, and so you've got different fingerings that you that you have to be be aware of. Uh, so the translation isn't direct, and you need to be aware of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it sounds like uh, Alex Evans is advocating for that four valve YEP three twenty one euphonium. Says they got them at Siloam and they're great. Is that the four valve non-compensating on top I mentioned? I think it, I think it was. Yeah, yep. it's a, it's a good horn. I mean, I play a Yamaha 842, which is you know a killer, you know, Alex awesome says, yes. instrument. Yeah. And and you and you can't we can't all afford those. And yep. I understand that. Yep. Meanwhile, Niall is trying to dig out of his hole with team saxophone, but I did not mention Kendall Tabor had a good explanation that sax invented the euphonium by way of apologizing for the saxophone. So now Kendall Tabor can be in the sights of saxophone nation. Well, um, I'll, I'll leave you with a, with a nice uh, saxophone story as long as we're just going there. I was at a classical saxophone conference once and a famous old saxophone master was talking about the history of the instrument. And uh, there were some, uh, there were about 10 or 15 other famous classical saxophone masters in the back of the auditorium. And he said something about a 10 year period um, in Belgium when a bunch of pieces were written for uh, the instrument, but technically because of warfare, uh, that part of Belgium, just technically during that 10 year period was, was part of France, but it was hardly worth mentioning. And uh, man, you would have thought that some epic, epic problem had come up at the UN in the back of that room, because uh, apparently it had been mentioned before and it was a big bone of contention. So uh, classical euphonium and classical saxophone they take their music very seriously and they, they have that in common. And, um, and I'm, I'm sure like Niall Kendall, Kendall loves those saxophone players too. And he was just kidding around. I mean, of course. Look, at, look at Niall's mustache and he's posing in front of an army flag. He's, he's, look at, here we go. Gonna go so, play Frisbee golf any second now. Stay out are, of the room. Are, are there any, is, any more questions or concerns I, or? I think we have reached our, our limit here for sex euphonium uh, information. Everybody's got Dr. Reed's email address, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, Sean, you might pop it in the, in the chat if you'd like. Um, as, as he said, everybody, you know, don't, don't miss a chance to bring him into your band room and, and get him with your students, not just once and not just a week before something important, but, but stay in touch. And, and like all the rest of us at tech, you know, he's really happy to come out and be involved and get to know your kids and your program over the long run. And that's really going to, you know, what's going to pay off for everybody involved. A lot of information here, Sean. Thanks again. Terrific. Uh, this uh, presentation is going to be on the website, I believe. That you sent the you sent in the PowerPoint to Jim. I did. Yep. 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 So, um, at that same link in the virtual academy, so atu.edu/bands, and you click on the resources for educators and on the virtual academy, and you can access. Uh, this stuff into perpetuity. There'll be a video of this week like the previous weeks as well. Um, share with your colleagues and share with your students um, as you see fit. Um, next week, um, the advertisement here, the commercial for next week, uh, Cooper Jr. from Cooper Music will be here with an with a instrument repair workshop for band directors, um, a re reminder session plus some new ideas on ways to uh, make uh, small repairs and uh, keep your instruments in great shape for the first hour. And the second hour, Professor Fuderer will be here talking to us about double reed intonation. And it does not involve burning any double reed instruments is an uh, important disclaimer. So hopefully we'll see you next week at four o'clock with uh, Cooper Jr. and five o'clock with Professor Fuderer for uh, week five of the Virtual Academy. If nothing else, thanks everybody, stay safe. Thanks again, Sean, appreciate you and appreciate everybody else being here with us today. Take care.